Hello, my name is Dennis Rubin, and I'm coming to you live from the FDIC 2022 podcast, Glass and Close Command Booth. What an honor and a pleasure it is to be here today to share a little information about a couple of books that I've prepared for fire engineering books. But before we get there, one of my close friends, Dan Kerrigan. Hello, how are you? Dan says hello, <laughs> is going to be talking about his efforts with his book first. Dan has had a chance to serve as a fire marshal, a fire chief, and perhaps most importantly, probably one of America's best fittest firefighters yes or no dan um the jury's still out on that there's yeah a lot there's over a million firefighters in this country so you know i, I, know. I we, we do our best we want to we want to lead by example that's the idea i saw dan yeah. uh at the bookstore mm -hmm. and he wasn't carrying one but two kettlebells and i think they were both 50 pounders mm -hmm. is that like uh something you do every day no no we we so funny they, they were actually 25 pounders we can't carry all the way to the hotel right but now we taught a class this morning a pre-conference workshop and and uh had a couple of implements there to to run the wow run the folks through there and and did some some good functional fitness stuff and and try to get some people some help on how to just take better care of themselves and live how up to their the own how did the class go the class went phenomenally it, it you know it's always great to engage people on that level um it's it's you know, it's a group setting, but you're really working individually with people, um, not just sitting there listening to us talk. We're up, we're doing activities, we're doing exercises, we're moving around, and we're sharing a philosophy about not only what to do and how to do it, but really most importantly, why why we need to do this as firefighters. And and in our in our case, myself, my partner Jim Moss, you know, we believe you swore an oath, and part of your oath is that you need to, to take better care of yourself and, and remain fit and healthy. I, I think I've read some of your stuff yeah. where you describe some fire departments take mm -hmm. better care of their rolling stock than they do <laughs> of their members. I, I've seen that, haven't I? Yeah. What um, does that mean? Well, it, it really, it, it's, it's sort of an analogy that we like to use that, that, that as you're well aware as a fire chief, is very few fire departments that do not have a preventive maintenance budget, right? For their apparatus, for their equipment. And why, well, I would ask why we do that. What do we do it for? We do it to maintain, to keep it in good shape, reliability, reliability yes, and sir. also why else longevity, right? Absolutely. And, and, and what else from a cost standpoint, from a fire chief perspective, it's, it has to come Drives into play, the cost down, sure. right? It's, it's cheaper for me to take care of the equipment proactively than it is after something major goes wrong with it. Well, so so is the same case for us as human beings. A little analogy is coming up here, isn't it? Right. So so many of our fire departments have no problem with with doing that, with taking care of their equipment and their apparatus. But when we when we talk about the same thing for their most important asset, the people, then there's a struggle, right? So not quite as many, not nearly as many fire departments have health and maintenance programs or preventative maintenance programs for their people in place like they do their equipment. And we're trying to change that message. We're trying to say we need to take care of our people now so that we don't have to worry about them big time later. What came first, Fire Chief, the <laughs> textbook or the training program? The, the textbook came, came first, but actually previous to the textbook was Jim and I writing articles, many of them for fire engineering that, that uh, seemed to really take root uh, at a grassroots level and became some of them almost viral, if you will, in, in the fire service world. Um, it kind of indicated to us that there was a need, that, that people needed to be talking about this a little bit more uh, proactively. And so instead of continuing to just write articles and putting them out there, we continued to develop our material and ended up with the book. And the book came from, this is the book, the book came from all of that aspect of not just working out, not just the fitness, but also like the nutrition, the, the hydration, the rest and recovery, the other things that, that make you uh, comprehensively healthy, right, if you will. And then the programs that came out of it, that came after. So we teach the programs and the workshops from the book, out of the material from the book. And it's, we share the philosophy that we believe works, uh, that, that, Performance comes first, not not your physique or what you look like. And that, you know, the more you take care of yourself now, the better off you're going to be not only for you, your community and your coworkers in while you're on the job, but also we want you to retire and have a long and healthy retirement. 
we know, I'm sure that you know people that have retired from a long, fantastic career in the fire service and died. And we don't want that. So, so it's a lifestyle and a philosophy that we try to, to share with people. You know, you, you mentioned a, a critical word. I've been blessed to sit mm -hmm. through a couple, two or three of your presentations, along with Captain Jim Likewise. Moss, the chief now. Captain. Captain. Yeah. Yep. And I, I also own a copy of your book. And mm -hmm. by the way, it's a signed copy. <laughs> Thank you both. You're but welcome. you talk about diet, exercise, yeah, yeah. lifestyle. So I understand the nutrition, mm -hmm. certainly the exercise, you speak volumes and in your book, but talk a little bit about the lifestyle. You were mentioning just a few minutes ago about some of the various substances that, that may not be really good. And for the most part, it's a stop. Don't do it. Sure. Well, the, the only full stop, right, that, that I would absolutely say to everybody that that no matter what it takes is if you're doing it, you need to stop is, is any kind of tobacco use is we, we know so much about how it will kill you. And, and there's really no excuse at this point, especially if you're in the fire service or any public safety agency to where you should be subjecting your body to that, you know, we're exposed to enough of that already just in the jobs that we do. So that would be the, probably the only full stops. Absolutely not. No exceptions, no tobacco. The fire service uh, uh, is actually, we do a pretty good job with that as compared to the general population. I believe our good friend, Sarah Janke, she has told me in the past that um, we're 22% or so, I believe, lower in terms of smoking than the general population here in the fire service. So that's one small win we have. Um, and I think it's important to continue that. The rest of it is really more about just, just taking care of yourself over the long haul. It's about you know, what you put in your body on a regular basis, considering your body a, a, a sports car, for example, right? If you put kerosene in a Ferrari, is it going to run as well as Probably not cheap. As, as, as if you another, put high tech, right? So that's why we want you to think about when you're eating and when you're drinking. And we're not suggesting that you can never have a slice of pizza or a glass of beer or whatever it is that you enjoy. We're not suggesting that at all. We just think it needs to be done in moderation. And that needs to be the exception more than the rule, I guess, if you would say. Um, put real foods from the right sources and the right amounts in your body, and you'll benefit from that for a long time to come. It doesn't matter how many days you spend in the gym if you're not if you're not taking care of yourself that way. I was a, a young, young firefighter, a young person when I got my first career job right out of high school. And for the most part, every one of the firefighters chewed tobacco. Mm -hmm. And I found myself chewing a piece of rope <laughs> tobacco. It was the most inexpensive. I'm sorry to hear that. I know. And they gave that stuff out like it was candy. Yeah. So after, I don't know, five or 10 minutes of chewing it, we got an ambulance call. Being the newest member, I was always the aid man, glad to do it, learn my EMT skills that way. And, and it was just like I was out of my body almost. And my head was so light, I couldn't feel my fingers. It was, a, it was an experience that I learned from that, never to do it again. Mm -hmm. But in that moment when the people needed me the most, thank goodness it was a moderate to minor call. Yeah. Um, I don't think I could have performed very well. Yeah, that, that's a problem too, right? And, and, and so I'm glad that you, I'm not glad you had that experience, but in a way I am because that that's a good way of, of uh, reminding yourself that you never want to feel I, like that again. A, a yeah. gentleman never tells his age, but at you, 19 you're... years old, I know I wasn't going to chew any more tobacco. That was a one time and only, and I, I, I hope <clears> I've <throat> recovered from that, but it was a horrible sure. sensation to, to not feel like I was in charge of my faculties. Yeah. It was almost, I, I, I I would never drink at work. I promise for all of folks out there, it was like having a couple, two or three beers. Yeah. It was like, what's going on here? Well, I think that I think that you and I both, you know, we, we came up in a fire service that if we think back on it, there were a lot of call them bad habits or, or traditions or things that happened around the fire station that some of which firefighters were very, very, very like forward in saying, well, if you make us do this, it'll be the end of the fire service. Air packs come to mind, right? How dare you, you know, we can't, when I, I mean, they were told me they were for emergencies when I started and just make sure you save your air in case you really needed it. But, you know, if we think back on that and those little, not changes of culture, but instilling new, new ideas into what's good about our culture, it takes time, but now, now, now it's the norm, so right? So that's ice cream what, after every meal is maybe not the best solution not maybe work and shift work well maybe not the best solution after every single meal but 
far be it for me to say you shouldn't, you, you can't have a bowl of ice cream. You know, what we would say is instead of taking the container and a spoon <laughs> and sitting down on the couch and the eating truth? from it, Isn't that, the that, truth? that you should, you should put some in a bowl and put it away. And that, so that's maybe another way of kind of portion control. Portion control is huge. You know, uh, we're told Americans eat 97% of what's on their plates. So that, that plate size really does matter. Right. If, if you're going, you're conditioned to do that. I'm sure I, I know I was from my parents. If you have a smaller plate, then you can put less food on it. You can still finish it all, but you're still taking in less calories. Right. I, I could remember being a brand new mm -hmm. firefighter in the district of Columbia fire department. We'll talk about that next year sure. about some I'm of my experiences there, but I would have to cook every once in a while, like every other firefighter. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I wasn't very good at cooking, so I would bring in food that my mom would prepare. And it was always delicious. God rest her soul. But you, I, I, I smirked about the portion sizes <laughs> because the code would always be do not lay out short, right. meaning make certain that every firefighter pretty much had two platefuls mm -hmm. and in those days really the plates probably look like platters yeah and i i think they did i really do chief and yeah. the other interesting part is at the time the some statistics were coming out that somewhere close to about a 20 15 to 20 pound weight gain for a brand new recruit firefighter you're in recruit school you're running miles every day <laughs> you're, you're doing other physical fitness stuff and then you, you go to work company, right? And things slow down remarkably. Yeah, and you're you were put into that that environment and that influence of the, the folks that work in that station. And no matter what you learn in recruit school, as you know, most new recruits when they show up at the fire station, as they probably should, they tend to keep their mouth shut and do what they're told and learn and listen. And that's if that's the culture in that fire station or that fire department, then there's not going to be very many new firefighters who are going to to go up against that. But you know, you, you've yeah. been in training for six months and now let us tell you how we really operate that, around ex here. Exactly. And unfortunately, I, I lived through that experience, but That's exactly um, what I mean. none the worse for wear. Mm -hmm. But I'm hearing the message loud and clear. Diet, exercise, mm -hmm. lifestyle really matters. It, it does. And I'm hearing your passion come across to be healthy, to uphold your pledge, to uphold your oath of office, mm -hmm. and even more importantly, to take care of your family and yourself well into retirement. I think that they, they the, the commitment and the sacrifice that your families make, just knowing what you do for, for a living as, a, as a, a vocation, I think that in and of itself should be enough um, drive or motivation to sort of give back to them and thank them for, you know, basically realizing that every time you leave to go to work, you may not come home. And I don't know about you, but there in my career, there's been a couple of times where I almost didn't go home. And, and so it's a real thing and they deserve that. Your community deserves it. I'm pretty sure that in a community uh, that, you, that you folks serve, that, that they, they expect firefighters to be fit and healthy and trained well and proficient in their jobs. They're allowed to expect that. It's an innate expectation for them. So we need to uphold the oath for them too, right? Chief, I've, I've watched Kelly Severide, Lieutenant mm -hmm. Severide, run up to a window in a burning building and jump from one building <laughs> to another. So I think the perspective of the mm -hmm. average citizen is that firefighters are almost at that super person Superheroes, level. Superheroes, right? Man, man or woman, be, be the, the great firefighter of today. Sure. So that, that's interesting perspective. You were here all week at FDIC. We're here, yeah. yeah. We're here until third. I'm here until Thursday. Until um, Thursday. Yeah, we'll be doing a, a book signing tomorrow. Book signing 10 tomorrow. To, Ten to eleven. Ten to eleven. So uh, with you, I believe. Also, oh, wow, you can come see the Rube mm -hmm. as well as Chief Kerrigan and, and Captain Moss. And the books are thirty. The, they're regular. 30%? Our book is regular. Yeah, the books are thirty percent off. So I believe ours off. is standard. Are you going to get it at any better price? No, not. No, no. You're not. I mean, it's yeah, not at all. And here's a chance to not get one author, but both authors to sign <laughs> off on those books. Absolutely. And what do you charge for that signature? Uh, absolutely nothing. It's free. Sometimes, sometimes we have to pay them. And to I'm, let us sign the book, right? And I've, and I've watched you work the crowd. It seems like every fit person comes up and has a word or two to say with you. Uh, and, and I mean that, fit firefighters. And, and obviously, it, it's pretty good for them to get renewed, refreshed, mm -hmm. to, to hear from one of the mentors 
you know, I'm going to call you one of the fitness icons. You can, you can brush it off all you want, but I think you've built a reputation of being one of those guys. And it's a, it's a, it's a cool thing to watch you. I'd love to be in the physical condition you are, but I know every time I interact with you, I've got to walk that extra yeah. mile or two to try it again, get caught up. We're, we're a little different in age. Hello. So I'm going to, I'm going to take passion on that part of it. Mm -hmm. But honestly, uh, you really have done an amazing job what you've done with the textbook, Appreciate what that. you've done with fire engineering to be able to get this message out to sit in on programs like this. It's, mm -hmm. it's a really important. It's, it's always a pleasure and we're always humbled to be asked. Um, we really just, we really have no other desire than just to help. If, if we can help firefighters in some way, that's, that's all we ever wanted to do. We didn't cool. set out to do anything more than that. And it's gratifying to know that we've been able to do that. So probably not quite as uh, exciting. No, what I want to talk awesome next stuff. about is DC fire. The district of Columbia was silly enough to hire me as the 25th fire chief. I know people are just falling out in the aisles, laughing at me now. Um, and I was the only person in our organization to go from private. I was a private in the seventies for seven years and came back as the fire chief. And, and I remember I'm from Washington. So there's always a lot of rumors that perhaps I may have married the mayor's daughter. And I would say being from Washington, I cannot confirm nor, nor deny, deny that rumor. Uh, the good news is he didn't have any daughters. So yeah. uh, I was lucky enough to work in a place where I grew up. I was born in that city, mm -hmm. raised in that city. But when I finished my term as fire chief, and I try to tell all fire chiefs to consider this, is I kept a pack of three by five cards close by. And when any interesting thing happened, I tried to jot it down. Hmm. We had a train crash one day, which I would put in the category, and, and I've been around for a while, as a career event. And the story is here. Nine people were killed that day. We operated at that event at the Metro Rail Collision um, on June 29th, 2009. So you can tell it's kind of burned into my memory bank. Um, we operated there for almost a week. We had media from around the world, literally in our backyard. We used every fire company in the District of Columbia, with the exception of the fire boats. Uh, we brought in all of our neighbors, which I don't think has happened. Uh, the immediate surrounding neighbors, again, perhaps uh, in all of history. So it was a big deal call. And I was lucky enough to put together not just about the operation and what occurred, the nine fatalities, over 150 injuries. We had seven or eight people that were in critical condition. But I also tried to give a snapshot of what happened behind the scenes. Uh, NTSB came in uh, to conduct the investigation. Uh, we transferred command during those seven days, I think, six different times, wow. six agencies, yeah. if you will. Uh, one thing that I'll mention very quickly it was interesting that the Secret Service showed up. They found out that there was no protectees aboard any of the trains that were involved in the collision, meaning high-ranking government officials. And, and they were just calling that quick, as, as fast as they got there. So hats off to them. The FBI spent a lot of time with us, and that was interesting. And that, unfortunately, one of the uh, fatalities, a uh, 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 major general, a two-star general, and his wife both succumbed to their injuries in this tremendous collision when the trains collided. But he actually uh, was visiting the wounded warriors uh, at the hospital um, in Washington, D.C. Really uh, sad. I'm, I'm sorry it's taken me a second. To, I'm flashing back to that event. And um, boy, it was just sad. But he was at Walter Reed checking on his soldiers. Uh, and again, it had nothing to do with terrorism. Uh, there wasn't any other side issues, any other related issues, but what had happened is that a train automatic controller failed and sent one train careening into the other at about 45, 47 miles per hour. So you can imagine the damage that occurred. Mm -hmm. We had a situation, as I uh, put in my note cards, where we were described as operating a brothel. Chief Dan, a brothel we, in one of yeah, our firehouses. That so That's we had to dispel that rumor. Mm -hmm. We worked very closely with the Metropolitan Police. Chief Kathy Lanier, a close friend and, and associate for years, she was the chief of the Metropolitan Police during my watch as the fire chief. And the way that we addressed that, one of the things that we did is we held a major press conference. The mayor got involved. The chief of police was there. I, I certainly spent my time there as well. 
uh, at the press conference. But the firehouse that they said where we were operating this, this uh, well, the newspaper cut said the best little firehouse in Northeast. <laughs> If you get the reference, I, I do. So we opened up every single door. Mm -hmm. I, I made it a point. Uh, there were I, I brought a handful of door chocks. So the bedrooms were blocked open. There's an officer's room and a firefighter's bedroom, a common bedroom. Um, every single door, restrooms, every door was open. You know, I look back on it. The only door I didn't chock open was the was a refrigerator door. Mm. And I think that helped the media to understand we had nothing to hide. Yeah. As the story would turn out. There were a couple of our members engaged in some very negative activity off duty, thank goodness, and they were um, participating in that trade in another community. They weren't even in the District of Columbia. Nonetheless, we had to stand good for it. And each of the stories that I share in here uh, wrap up with the leadership piece. How was it handled? How was it resolved? Uh, and that became pretty important. And then there's a whole host of things uh, getting a chance to meet with President Bush 43 seven times, President Obama 44 twice. Yeah. Uh, we were one of the first communities to receive one of the steel girders uh, from, from September 11th. The chief of police had a very close friend that was killed that day there. Uh, so we were honored with that as an example. So the DC fire book really is a chronicle of what those four years were like in a very large major metropolitan community. At the time we had about uh, 200, I'm sorry, 2,400 members. We operated out of 34 firehouses, which included a fireboat uh, of three different companies within the fireboat family staffed around the clock. And we did about a quarter of a million calls so it was really interesting. It was a lot of fun. I've enjoyed it. And I'll be here all week signing DC Fire. I would highly recommend it. I think the biggest, the biggest thing for me to take away from that is the, is the leadership aspect of, of those lessons and those experiences that you put in there. That's, um, I mean, we all, we all want to know that, like, you know, we want to hear the cool stuff, the stories and, 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 you know that sort of thing but but how you handle those kinds of things is that takes it to the next level i think it's a you, sometimes there's no you know we know this from efo days there's no you can't go on the internet and look up how to handle this stuff it's an adaptive issue right it's it really it's, is you have to figure out moving at at real speed how to how to solve these very serious problems and do the, do it correct. You have very little information sometimes and one chance to get it right. We uh, opened up yeah. with a story. I was there for, believe it or not, two weeks. And, and anybody that works in our field knows two weeks is a very important day because it was my first paycheck. Mm -hmm. So that morning I was that abruptly woken up from a sound sleep. We had had a third alarm at the Eastern Market. And we had about four or five wagon pipes and uh, ladder pipes operating. And this is a long building. It was built at the turn of the century, as in the 1900s, uh, uh, 1800s to 1900s. And with that said, it housed about 30 different businesses inside. You could go there and perhaps get uh, fresh cut meats or cheeses or a newspaper, uh, flowers. There was a flower shop inside. So we had a major fire there, probably about a $20 million fire. And of course, as I'm, I'm helping with the press conference and the mayor asked me what transpired. And I described the fact that how many firefighters, how many companies, how hard the women and men worked to extinguish the fire. And, and he described all that. And after he finished describing that, I was sitting back enjoying life. And then he said, and now our chief's going to talk a little bit. Well, there wasn't much for me left for me to talk about. Sure. So the only thing I could think of, this is a treasure. And it, it is, it, it is and was, still is today. And the mayor described the fact that it was going to be rebuilt. So what I did is I gave an impassioned speech about how it has to be rebuilt with sprinkler system. There you go. And that it would never happen job. again. And, and we had it rebuilt with a sprinkler system. But the chief operating officer, who was also the financial officer, he just had a very long face mm, as sure. I did that. But to Mayor Finty's credit, we actually had that bill. And I tell that story to get to the next one, which will go pretty quick as well. But we're on the steps of fire administration. And we're uh, now having our second and final press briefing. And the mayor is standing tall. And wait, what a great person. I, I loved him then and I love him now. Mayor Finty was one of the best mayors in our city's history. 
and um, the alarm comes out and the alarm is for the Georgetown library. So again, I'm, I'm still waiting to get to that first paycheck. I got to look at that stub to see what I made. And um, as the call comes out and we're standing in front of all of these television cameras in the Washington media, I, I rock back a little bit because the mayor was at the podium and the number two chief, Larry Schultz, I'm going to give him a, a shout out. I know Chief Schultz. Well. Crazy. What Great guy. Incredible. Yep. Crazy good he's guy. one of the best. He is a top shelf yep. of the top shelves of yes, the top shelves. And he's telling me, just calm down, Rube, calm down. It's going to be nothing. That's what you're so, that's what your yeah. deputy chief supposed to do. Yeah. Right? And and of course, engine five goes on location with fire through the roof and strikes a second alarm. So inside of that first two weeks, which again is chronicled in the book, mm -hmm. uh, we probably hit somewhere close to about $60 million in fire loss. So I thought maybe I'd actually get a pay raise. Both of those fires made NFPA's top fires, top 10 fires mm -hmm. for 2007. So I'm glad the mayor had the foresight to hire me as the fire chief so we could eliminate the fire problem Fantastic. in this city. But there's so much information. And again, it describes the press conferences and how that worked. The other book that I'm really proud of, this came out a couple of years after DC Fire, is it's always about leadership. Once again, I, I put myself in a position to track and to, to put together a lot of information on three by five cards. As you can tell, I've got a lot of stock uh, in paper. Mm. And anytime there was a leadership lesson, for instance, lead from the front, tell the truth uh, would be some of the examples. I put that into three by five, and then I started to flesh it out a little bit. And lo and behold, over the years, since I was a battalion chief, which again, it's been a long time ago, um, I would pull out that deck of cards, three by fives, and I would use that for a recruit school graduation. Or maybe it was a speech I was asked to give for a civic club. And after a while, a couple of folks said, boy, do better than the three by five cards, started committing that to writing. Well, I had a little bit of traction with fire engineering at this point. My very first book, which is long out of print, was called Rube's Rules for Survival. I wish I had left off the rules, uh, Rube's part, but I laid it out of the safety rules that a firefighter needs. And that was my first effort. Now I had DC Fire in the Bank. So when I pitched the idea of a leadership book, and I wanted to make it again in rules or 13 rules, um, it goes into a discussion about how each rule is applied. And it's the type of book that I hope company officers buy and they sit around the dinner table and talk about it, but there are 13 rules in here. And in the opening, I was so blessed, DC Fire Chief Brunacini wrote the foreword and leadership Chief Varner wrote the foreword. And um, I'm, I'm hoping that it keeps people out of trouble. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of folks that got into the miseries that outperformed our ability to help them, they, they lost their jobs. Nobody during my watch has ever lost their job for rubbing a, 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 a tire up against the curb or backing into a doorway or coming to work late or saying a snide comment to another member because people do have bad days. These were really serious events. I'm sure they were. And part of the book tried to reach out to our members to say, don't drink and drive. Don't put yourself in a position that when you go home, you're going to act out against your family members. Uh, and the domestic violence is something we couldn't couldn't outperform. Don't find yourself in a position where you're going to have the police intervene and, and heaven, if they have to, maybe there's still a little bit of hope, but don't start beating up on the cops. So between keeping the cards for both the, the amazing and wonderful and interesting things that happened and my leadership, uh, three by five cards, I started doing presentations for our people to say, yeah, here's the hot buttons. Um, we would go out and do physical presentations. Chief Schultz again was there at my side along with some other great chiefs. And then we actually put together a 30 minute video presentation that went out each month. And we would try to highlight, you know, uh, we had a person that shook a baby uh, so hard that the baby had to go to the hospital for a couple of days. And the members spent some time incarcerated. Well, you know what? You just outperform what I can fix. Sure. Yep. So that was the message that we wanted to get out. And I think that's what the folks would find. And it's always about leadership. That's I, such I think that book. it's it's absolutely. And I, and I can tell you, 
uh, and I don't know what 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 you're presenting this year class wise, but I've been in I've sat through your class uh, here at FDIC and and that one specifically. And there's a lot to be said in appreciation for for chiefs like you that took the time, the forethought to make those notes and to write that stuff down and then actually to to put it to, to paper and actually pay it forward a little bit and and share experiences and and maybe you know and in some cases we make mistakes and we try to make sure that the next person doesn't make that mistake and that's that's the benefit of that book hands down and i've sat through the class and i understand what those those principles are and it's well worth the read and it's well worth the listen any day of the week i i've been there and i've i've seen it and um i would i would vouch for it forever so yes. blessed with the two books uh, and and again the support from fire engineering mm -hmm. Um, I'm hoping uh, the future snapshot for me looks like an operations book uh, that I'm, I'm describing how to apply crew resource management. It's, uh, it's about halfway done. It's not under contract yet, so I'm not going to make any guarantees to anybody. I know it will be out this fall. I hope it's under the banner of fire engineering. But ultimately, it takes the skills, the training, the, the uh, uh, processes that the aviation industry uses, and it tries to apply it to the command post. You know, when you're flying, you hope that there's one takeoff goes perfect. There's no incidents right. between the landing and if the landing goes well, and that doesn't happen by magic. There's a lot of decisions that get made. There's a lot of uh, what they call challenge and confirm. And some of the things I think that we can apply. So that's the coming attractions for me. I know that you're continuing to work to and develop great information mm -hmm. related to firefighter health and fitness. I think you're, you're working through and helping with some of the cancer registries. We're doing, we're doing, we with, try to with, do. With yeah. Dr. I mean, Chanky. I, I do uh, uh, some work with some of our amazing fire service researchers, uh, including Sarah and, and Dr. Denise Smith. And there's a whole host of them. I, I should probably not name names because you know, you're going to forget somebody, right? That's for um, sure. Yeah. So, so, but, but, and, and then just trying to do whatever I can do to, to pay it forward in terms of, helping people take better care of themselves and uh, being on the safety health and survival section board of directors and having an influence over um, pushing things like annual medical evaluations and behavioral health assessments. And all of these things are so important. How about life scan? Is that important? You know, I, I let that slip before I got to my books. Well, life scans, a, it, it, life scans a provider that, that, that will come to you and provide those, those annual NFPA compliant medical evaluations, very, very comprehensive um, I was hoping you were going to talk about the comprehensive part. Sure. With your help, I, I had a chance to mm -hmm. take that physical from head to toe. Thank goodness I got a clean bill of health. Mm -hmm. But boy, it was uh, truly as thorough a physical as I've ever experienced. Would you agree? When, 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 when we instituted them at the department I was previously at, that was the comment that I received back from our firefighters tongue in cheek. Wow, that was the most, that was the most comprehensive physical that I've ever ever received and they ever at 201 they thanked me um things were found out that weren't known thankfully minor in in all cases uh but but comprehensive is is exactly the way to put it you have to as a firefighter physicians need to be looking at you through a completely different lens than than a, a general population civilian uh, because of the things we're exposed to because of the the physiological changes that that our bodies go through when we're engaged in strenuous firefighting so when you go and you get these you get advanced blood work done you get your cancer markers you get you know you all your traditional physical hearing you know vision and all that stuff of course spirometry you know we'll do chest x-rays we will do uh they'll bring a fitness assess an exercise physiologist and we'll do a fitness assessment to just show you where you're at it's not punitive just is where you're at right now so that you know um and and the coup de gras right is the ultrasound uh, you know, having an ultrasound tech come to your fire department and look at you from head to toe on the inside, look at every organ, look at your carotid arteries, look at those, those things and try to help identify underlying causes of, of what kills us, right? And early detection is key. That's really what it comes down to. So we could talk about fitness and nutrition and all of that stuff from, but, you know, if you're a fire department that has not yet instituted uh, some kind of appropriate 
annual medical evaluation for your personnel. That is the first basic, most basic step. We have to get more people doing that. We have to get more departments doing that because that early detection, it, it means the world to people. I myself had a scare in one of those uh, exams myself. Thankfully, knock on wood, it, it, it was nothing. And, and, but I would have never known it one way or the other, even if it had been something, if it had not been for that exam. And, you know, knowledge is power. And if you don't know if there's something wrong with you, you certainly can't do anything about it to fix it. So get the physical. That's that's the message. And, and suppose if you aren't able to get as comprehensive, but you can still get a physical, mm -hmm. the, the answer is annually, Chief? Annually, absolutely. And, and there's a document um, called the Provider's Guide to Firefighter Physicals that you can go on. Just If you just search that on the internet, it should come up. Uh, that's a free document that you can actually print out and download and take even to your personal physician. And it outlines all the different components that you'll find in NFPA standard in 1582 so that you can educate your doctor on why he needs to look or she needs to look wow. at these things. So it's free. It's, it's, if you, if you can't afford to go to an OC health physician, if you can't, if your department doesn't provide it, you can still download that document, take it to your own personal physician and say, doc, here you go. This is what I need from you because I'm a firefighter. It was uh, really interesting when I finished mine. And again, it was because you did all the late work to allow our folks to go through that process. Um, the physician's assistant and the lead nurse took me aside and they said, you know, you're, you're in pretty good health. And I, I think I can give my age away a little bit by saying I, that I get a pension every, every month. So I've been around a while and they were very complimentary. And I thought, oh, this is good. And let me get out of here. And they said, no, no, no. But, but, and the, but was slow down with pork, slow down with beef, mm -hmm. slow down with eggs. And, and I don't want to go through the whole litany, yeah, but sure. they gave me some things to do that they said, if you do these things for us, um, you know, when we see you next year, most likely we're going to say your class A physical zero defects, mm -hmm. get back out there and do your job. So that, that turned on a light, a really big light for me. And it wasn't just the standard physical and the doc sending you out the door. No, they sir. took the time to go over every single item. And, and both of the folks were really gracious with their time. And I know they're getting paid for that, but they went into a great elaboration. So uh, about Dennis Rubin and what his health yeah. status was. So I appreciated that. And again, I don't think we would have experienced that if it weren't for Chief Kerrigan. Well, I, it's just... I... You're welcome, I guess. I, it's not that I need Nicely credit said. for. I, 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 I just, it's, it's just really important um, to, that we do it and we do it the right way. We don't just check a box. And, and uh, you know, part of that is educating people. Yep. Some, some firefighters and firefighters, they don't even know. They don't understand what, what actually needs to happen or what happens to our bodies or why we should take care of ourselves a certain way. And so the education has to come first. And then I think it's a little easier to get all the actual tactical steps in place, if you will. Uh, but you're right. They, do you want to get a physical that's comprehensive? You're going to spend two, two and a half hours. You're going to sit down and talk with people one-on-one -on -one personally, and they're going to learn you and get to know you. And that's what, that's, I think that's what sets them apart is that they, that they develop that relationship with you. And then they have that baseline and then they come back the next year and they know you and they have what they had from last year. And you develop also a baseline of good health. God forbid you get diagnosed with cancer, occupational cancer. Wouldn't it be great to have a baseline of good health, years of passing medical exams that you were cancer free and all that. And, and now you have that as extra proof when you have to fight that presumption fight that, that you were healthy when you started this job. You can and document that. This. Chief, and, and again, uh, relative to comments about health and fitness, my, my last thought is in 1980, I joined a hazmat team. I'd been on the job for a while. Sure. And from 1980 to today, I have two four inch binders with every single sheet of paper that I ever got from a doc that uh, uh, EKG strips, um, mm -hmm. any prescriptions, I got it all. 
And I don't think I would have had that if it weren't for the hazmat. And of course, they were doing very heavy metals and things like that. Yep. It was a pretty comprehensive in 1980 medical physical. But you're right. I, I think to keep track of that's important. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. We use we use things nowadays like like the Enfers exposure tracking uh, app and, and all, phenomenal stuff that's out there for free that you can essentially take charge of your own health as a firefighter and document those uh, exposures, document traumatic events. You can you can do all that, and it creates a diary of of your own health, if you will, and your experiences and exposures. And it can go anywhere with you. It doesn't matter what fire department you end up with. It's it chronicles your history as a firefighter in the terms of and the things that you've been exposed to. So the folks at International Public Safety Data Institute phenomenal job doing that. There's so many tools out there now for us that we didn't have when we started. We just have to educate people and get and the word heaven out there. forbid we'd ever go through another pandemic. I pray that we never see that. I, my, my mom was born in 1917, and I think mm -hmm. that was the last time there was a world pandemic. But what you've mm -hmm. described, think about that in terms of what we suffered through with COVID mm -hmm. and the firefighters, paramedics, and EMTs that were exposed and got sick and in some cases are still long haulers without mm -hmm. having that documentation and the details that you described. Uh, it would be a futile battle, but thank goodness they're, they're all doing good, the ones that I know. Mm -hmm. Chief, we're closing out the session yeah. now. Any last comments for our viewers? We, we've got probably millions or at least <laughs> thousands or, or maybe hundreds. a couple of hundred people <laughs> listening in. And who knows where this will go? Right. But any closing comments? For I just our... want to thank you for inviting me up and, and getting a chance to chat. And uh, you and I are great friends, uh, obviously, outside of this. Tremendous supporter of all the stuff that you've done for the fire service. And uh, um, yeah, I just would say that buy Rube's books, you know, they're, <laughs> they're worth it. And and if we can ever help you, Jim and I can ever help any of you out there uh, on a personal level or organizational level with anything in terms of your health and wellness concerns, just reach out. You know, we answer everybody. We answer every single person. So um, come see us if you're here at FDIC. Come see us tomorrow at our class at 1.30. Come say hi at the book at the bookstore, um, but we're here to help. So how do they get in do. touch with you? Say maybe either by sure. uh, email or, or by yeah, Twitter. I how mean, would they do that? What's probably the easiest way is just to, well, the website is firefighter, firefighterfunctionalfitness.com. Um, firefighterfunctionalfitness at gmail.com would be our generic Perfect. Gmail address that goes to J both Jim and I. So that, to keep it short and sweet, that would be probably the easiest way, but we're also on Twitter and LinkedIn and, you know, all the other social media, Instagram and Facebook, our handle is at firefighter F fit, follow us for free stuff and motivation and all that too. But if you need to get a hold of us, reach out, find us, we will help every single part. We always help every single person. That, that address one more time. Firefighter functional fitness at gmail.com all one word ladies and gentlemen firefighters present past and mm -hmm. in the future you've been listening to chief dan kerrigan he is one of america's best and most fittest fire chiefs the only weakness that i know that this man does have and he does have one weakness is that he is a flyers fan so philadelphia flyers have let him down you have, this year you have to have some sympathy uh, for me i know for I'm that this year please i i, please. Uh, I, I uh, work on a on a different team mm -hmm. uh and and that's is what it is but but dan's an incredible person Thanks. an incredible friend and a great family man i'm dennis rubin it's been an honor to be here with you uh, at fdic if you haven't experienced it i'm telling you find the time, oh, find the resources, 100%. find the money. This 100%. class and closed center, we're probably looking at what, 25, 50 million, if not billions of dollars of fire apparatus on the floor. There'll be 35,000 of Dan's closest friends here. There are so many extracurricular activities uh, from street parties to different events where the band and antique fire apparatus mm -hmm. will be uh, shown, not to mention the best educational programs, the best material, the best instructors, Simply put, it's the best. So come yeah, to Indianapolis yeah. next year if you're not here already. And if you're here, we're truly expecting you to stop by and say hi to us tomorrow or anytime during the week. This is Dennis Rubin once again signing off for FDIC 2022, the podcast from the, the Glass and Close Command Center here. And uh, what an honor it is to be a part of this show. Thank you very much.